Uh, before we get this session underway, I just wanted to say a few words of welcome and to put this event into context. Now, as you probably know, I'm sure you do, March the 8th is International Women's Day, and thousands of events are held throughout the world to inspire women and to celebrate their achievements. Now, this date has been observed since the early 1900s, a time of great expansion, 1900s obviously, and turbulence in the industrialized world that saw booming population growth and the rise of radical ideologies. Now, March the 8th is a day when we do take time, or should take time, to reflect on the sacrifices made by women worldwide who brought about positive changes for us. But one day in the year is not enough. So during my term as presiding officer, one of the themes I am concentrating on is equality. And this year, the focus is on women. And today's seminar will explore the barriers to women's participation and representation. Now, as I said, I've held a series of similar regional events across Wales over the past few months, which will come, culminate in a national conference on November the 27th, 22nd, November the 22nd at the National Assembly. And I hope that that conference will be able to build on the outcomes of each of the events that we've held. And what we need to do is to task, what you need to do is to task me and my fellow Assembly members with actions to ensure that the barriers to participation are removed. Now, these events are deliberately small. They're not elite, but they are small because I feel you come to a big event, people don't take part. Goodness me, something happening out there. So please feel free you know, to, to contribute. Now, the Assembly does have a legal duty under the Government of Wales Act to promote equality. And I'm personally very pleased that this duty has been taken extremely seriously since the Assembly came into being in 1999. Now, delivering equality has become part of our custom and practice. But importantly, as some of you may have heard me say before, we don't do it because we have to, we do it because we want to, and because it's the right thing to do. A couple of months ago, I addressed a group of women from Libya and Jordan who had come to learn about what we do. And I can tell you, it was a stark reminder of the continuing struggle uh, to get women's voices heard in some parts of uh, the world. We think we struggle in some parts of Wales, but across the world, it's bordering on criminal. I'm particularly delighted that Ellen Rees, Managing Director of Telescope, a leading multimedia production company, has agreed to chair today's session. If you don't know Ellen, she's a real bottle of pop. She's fantastic. <laughs> um, now, Ellen will introduce our panel, um, and they're all people who continue to push at artificial barriers that are put in the way of women in Wales. I hope you enjoy the, the session. Please take part. So, Jochen Baal. Ellen, over to you. I'm not sure how to take that bottle of pop. Does that mean I'm full of gas? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, that would have been all right. Um, if you would all put on your, um, your translators, just, just for a moment, um, so that we can uh, have a word in the language of heaven. <laughs> Um, does it work? Does everybody, can everybody hear the gentleman over in the, in the corner? Um, Gai Vioch and Vaur Yawn, he lowered the Kanishiad, he Rosemary Butler. I think I'll try Hello, hello, Yawn. Good. Um, Gai Vioch and Vaur Yawn, he Rosemary Butler, I'm Van Wanghodi, he got Dario. Um, and have it um wahod can get minds over an award see we decarive through life of lane show and income day fastney um on dinner benny heroes many demand or her with a hug with he see the more of rude for a dig um akmar gadarn or ran and sub points me fell man award um very king weld he and he sued or get he and the commission Mae hi dod yn drosto yn ddoeth ac yn gadarn ac yn gryf, ond hefyd mae hi'n amlwg yn ddynes hyfryd, ac fi'n credu bod hynny i'w ymfalchio yn ynddo, a felly diolch yn fawr iawn i chi. Ac yn dod i'r ddwy. No, wel, un o resymau pan dwi'n licio cael fy nghyfieithu yw bod y cyfieithydd fel arfer yn wneud i fi swnio'n well, nag ydw i pan ydw i yn siarad Cymraeg. Beth bynnag, Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi am gyfieithu, sir, um, a diolch i'r cynulliad am ganiatau i, i ni siarad Cymraeg neu Saesneg yn y digwyddiadau yma, 
ac os oes unrhyw un yn yr ystafell, dwi'n gwybod mai, dwi'n meddwl mai dim ond un o ddwy sydd yma sydd yn siarad Cymraeg. Os ydych chi eisiau holi cwestiwn neu ddweud gair yn Cymraeg, mae perffaith groeso i chi wneud, dim ond i chi godi lan yr dweith y pawb yn godi lan yr rothfel. Um, diolch yn mor iawn. Ok, guys, um, I shall now continue in English, having um, thanked the translator, because he probably didn't thank himself when I, uh, when I said that. Um, I just want to tell you what our task is for the next hour and a half. Um, it's basically, as you've heard, to discuss the barriers that stop women taking up places of influence in public life and to discuss whether those barriers in fact do exist, are they in, in our imagination, and what ways are there that we can break them down, jump over them, go under them, whatever is necessary to get more women interested in positions where they have influence. We have three speakers, but following the three speakers, we're going to speak of their experience in getting where they have. I really hope, and I've had a word with, with some um, of you already, that I hope you will um, find it easy to contribute to today's session, because that's what we want, is, is a, a good heart-to-heart -heart about um, the situation and about what we can do to improve it. Um, and whilst many people may not think that there are barriers, I think some of the statistics um, demonstrate to the contrary, and in particular in my own field, um, which is the media, 78% um, of newspaper articles, according, this is according to the Guardian newspaper, by the way, 78% of newspaper articles are written by men. 72% of the panellists on Question Time are men. 84% of guests on Radio 4's Today programme are men. And 70% of the contributors on Any Answers. So there you have the TV programmes that usually quiz and have as guests. Um, opinion formers and decision makers, um, you can see that the statistics show um, that the not many women are represented. In fact, it never goes over 30%. Um, I've been asked uh, to give a short, very short presentation about any barriers that I may have come across. Um, I have a, a television company based over the water, over, over there, uh, in SA1, um, and I employ 30 people, and I've had the company for 20 years. And I'm pleased to say that 70% of my staff are women. That isn't to say that the media, in, in its essence, is any better than, than a lot of public bodies in employing women at the senior positions. I mean, we've never, ever had um, a director general at the BBC. There are many middle managers, but you know that is often true. Um, but the senior positions are very, very, very much still a, a male stronghold. So in looking back at, at, at my career, I mean, in terms of telescope, when I first started, I can't say there was any barrier to me starting, but the really funny thing that happened was that I started a business myself, and then a year later, my husband left the BBC. My husband's a programme maker, so he came to work for me at telescope, which is really nice, except, of course, that then S4C and the BBC kept writing to him and not to me. So it was dear Richard, managing director of Telescope, and he would very embarrassingly bring the letters over and say, oh, really sorry, Ellen, um, I think this must be for you. Um, I would have occasion where um, I would go and see people to um, pitch business, and they would ask me, when can I meet the managing director? And I'd say, you're looking at her. And they would say, oh, sorry, I thought your husband was in the business. I'd say, yeah, he is. I pay him a salary for working for me. And they would go, my God, your husband works for you? you know, um, and i say, yeah, I, I, I do pay him a salary. It's not a problem for him. It's not a problem for me. But obviously, people felt that it was weird because we were married, and therefore, it must be he who's in charge. And I, I dare say it, wouldn't, it would have been, wouldn't have been the same had had the roles been reversed, that somebody would have said to him, you know, your wife must be the managing director. Thankfully, he's fine about it, and it is humour, by and large, um, that has, has got us through it. Because at the beginning, I found it really, really annoying and, and lost my temper quite a few times. But I often, I often think, OK, what was it that made me have the drive to do what I do? And we look maybe at role models in our lives. My mother... Um, who's still with us at 89 and going strong, is a very different woman to me. Um, she gave up her work in order to look after my father in terms of looking after him in his career as a Baptist minister. So she would feed him, 
lunch, supper, go with him to visit people, go with him to hospitals, um, iron his shirts continually. And I guess maybe, maybe I, the, the role model that she was made me be the opposite to what she was. Um, although she's a wonderful person. Um, but now I'm a little bit worried about the role model that I am to my own daughter, who is a, an only child. How does she perceive me? And would she really like to be like me? Because I go home of a meeting absolutely exhausted, flopped in a chair, no desire to do anything other than watch neighbours or whatever, um, and pour myself a, a glass of a gin and tonic. Um, and does she look and think, oh my gosh, I really don't want to be like my mother? In which case, I've done something very, very wrong. Um, in terms of the next generation wanting to be like me, who is somebody who wanted to be so different from my mother. Anyway, that's just one point I thought I'd bring up. Um, I then graduated in science, the only uh, one of two women um, on my course, and then I did a job for one year, for five years, sorry, as, as the only uh, water quality sampler in Wales, which meant going to sewage works and water treatment works on my own, um, and into various places, uh, pollution incidents. And it was very much a woman in a man's job. Um, and there were things that I enjoyed about it because I was different, you know, and, 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 and there was quite some amusing um, instances. But there were also some really difficult ones. But one humorous one, which I think um, typifies the difference between a man and a woman sometimes in their roles, is that I'd go to Mirtha Mawr Sewage Works um, where uh, I'd have to take a sample of the final effluent. Always a great task because the final effluent, of course, is quite clean going back into the river. Anyway, um, I couldn't lift the manhole cover because it was way too heavy. So I'd go and ask the boys um, on the gang, um, say, oh, do you mind coming to, to help me lift the manhole cover? So naturally you had the, ah, you can't do this job, can you? You sort of always need a man. What the hell are you doing in this job? But after a while, um, I got to know some of the guys on the gang. Um, and one of them asked me, Aileen, why do you take the sample here every time? And I said, well, because this is where the responsibility of Welsh water ends. If I took it down by the river, um, that would be wrong because that's the council's jurisdiction. Oh, right, okay. So why do you ask? Well, because the boys always take it down by the river. Oh, really? So anyway, I go back to the office and I ask my colleague, male colleague, why do you take the sample of final effluent in Mirtha um, Mawr? Oh, down by the river. But you're not supposed to. No, I know, but the manhole cover's way too heavy, I can't lift it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have an instance of a woman who's prepared to ask for help to do it, whereas the man wouldn't ask for help to do it, because let's face it, he would have been called a wuss, and, and, and worse, he'd probably been called a woman, you know? <laughs> so, however, on, on a more serious note, I then wanted to go for promotion, and my boss at that time took me one, to one side and said, look, Aileen, we are going back 30 years, 30, 35, yeah, 35 years. Um, you've, uh, you've just got married, and the chances are that you're going to have kids. And do you really think that you should be going for this role? Because, um, you know, you think about my position, because I've got, and he named my colleague, the male one who took the sample by the river, um, he's... Uh, He's, he's just had a, his wife's just had a baby, he's got responsibilities, he's got family life. You know, don't go for it, Aileen, because I'm not going to give it to you, I'm going to give it to him. And it was then, I think, that that was that jolt of thinking, hang on a minute. And then, much to my embarrassment, five years later, I left the Water Authority because as a woman, I couldn't do the job. Because I was going out into the wilds and lonely places, I was indecently exposed to twice, not by colleagues, but by general men in the field. <laughs> Um, to the point where I'm still afraid of going to lonely places by myself. And I actually feel quite guilty to admit that I actually did leave that role because I was a woman and I couldn't do the job. Um, and I went into broadcasting after that, where the role of the woman is defined by the way that she looks, to all intents and purposes. And, you know, you get by if you're reasonably good-looking and that you can do your job. And it is an industry where there's certain aspects of it that I dis detest. And that is one of the things that I detest about it, because you can be a brilliant man, but look as ugly as Shrek, and you can carry on to the high echelons of, of, of the broadcasting. Whereas if you are a brilliant woman, like Professor Mary Beard, for instance, then your life is made hell by not just your bosses, 
because to be fair to them, they've let her continue, but, but, but by the public who, who write in and call her ugly, and, and I mean, it's just, it's just awful. So um, what I'm quite pleased about now is um, that when I left the Water Authority, my boss gave me a little plaque, not the same one that didn't give me promotion, this was another guy. It, it was a little plaque that said, if you want to see your name on the map, publish your own map. And that is what I have lived by ever since then, through the last days of Water Authority, to the media, to starting my own company. Um, and, you know, having the sense of humour to battle through the times when you think, Pippin Eck, there are people who are looking at me here and thinking, she can't do this. Um, but I have kept my company for 20 years. I do employ 30 women. Um, sorry, not 30 women, 70% of my 30 staff are women. And also in the last eight years, I've had 10 pregnancies. None of them mine. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the, that the women are back in role, carrying on working um, and sharing that with their family life. And I am particularly proud of that. So anyway, those are some of my experiences and I hope some of those points resonate with you um, and, and that we can talk about them. I would like to introduce now our first panellist, um, who is Elizabeth Aitken. Um, she is Assistant Chief Officer, Director of Resources and Treasurer of the Fire and Rescue Authority. Um, in that role, she is also qualified as an accountant and has 30 years worth of experience in public sector, in public sector finance in particular. So she's had various posts. Um, and does a lot of dealing with uh, the Welsh Assembly Government and in, is a person in um, public service. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your views about what it is like there and why you think maybe that not enough women actually take on those roles, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elin. Well, I thought I'd approach this um, from the perspective of why, why I thought I had got to where I am. Um, in the, in the hope of trying to learn something from that and, and trying to you know, give something to others from that. So um, really starting from the very beginning, um, from a small child, um, just having a very supportive family. I think this is something that runs right through my career. And this is what I've sort of, um, thinking back now about it, um, you know, I had a very, very supportive uh, father, a very traditional father, as in, you know, my mother gave up work to look after the family, but no way was I going to do that. <laughs> so um, right from the very beginning, I was brought up to think and believe and expect to have as good a career uh, as a man. You know, no way was I going to ever have to rely on a man. I would be self-reliant. And there was absolutely never, you know, any question about that. Um, there was never, um, right through my career, I've never actually, if you like, thought of myself as a woman. I've never, it's never been an issue for me in any way. It's been issues for other people. Um, and so I, I have heard you know, some, of the, some of the discussions um, on why women don't feel they can go for jobs and so on. Um, and people talk about confidence, you know, people, women not having confidence. But I think it's, I, I have a slightly different perspective on that. I think it's about expectation. I think women should be taught to expect the same life career um, as a man. And, you know, expectations, you know, not just um, in the home, but in the workplace, um, can be learned. Um, you know, I, I um, was good at maths when I was young, so the obvious thing to do was to become an accountant. Um, and apparently, um, in doing the research for this, um, for this talk, um, there's a very few percentage of um, women in, on, on executive boards, on boards of companies or, or public sector organisations. But the very few that are, for example, on the, 100 FTSE, the top 100 FTSE companies, 6% uh, of those uh, positions are taken up by women, but the majority of those women got there because they're accountants and they are directors of finance on the board. That's how they got on the board. Um, so I was very fortunate in that 
you know, I was good at maths, and so I, I wanted to become an accountant. I, was, I wanted to become an accountant from a very early age, from, a, from about the age of eight. If somebody asked me what I wanted to do, I would have been an accountant. So I, I knew, always knew what I wanted to do. And I went through my uh, school days and university with that very specific aim in mind, and I wanted to be in the public sector. So I was very specific about what I took in my university degree so that I would be exempt from the relevant subjects when I came on to do accountancy. And I, I, when I did accountancy in, in my um, university, I couldn't wait to get out into, into a job, you know, to actually put this into, into, into effect, into good use uh, uh, for the public sector. And I was very much uh, that way inclined. Um, Trainee jobs then were available. It's a totally different scenario to today. We're talking uh, the late 70s. There were, there were trainee accountant jobs out there. And, um, and I managed to get one, um, and, and locally as well, um, local to where I lived. So I didn't move anywhere, and I didn't have that sort of perhaps um, hassle to, to worry about. Um, but I got this job and um, a, a male, uh, there, was, there were two jobs going, uh, I got one and, and uh, a man got the other. Um, and then the first, in the first couple of days, I was talking to one of the senior women there who said, oh, um, you're, the, you're the first female accountant we've ever had. And I, I don't know whether, you know, that was meant to bring me down in some way, or whatever, but it just had a total opposite effect. So I just thought, Yes, and I'm going to be the most exceptional person that you've ever had then. That's, that's, what, I, that's what that made me think. And, you know, I, I acted like that right through my training period. And to be honest with you, ever since, I, I act in the, in, the, in the way that, you know, I'm I determined to be, you know, bright, bubbly, inquisitive, ask questions the whole time, really put myself out there. I really um, never, when people used to ask me, you know, what do you want, where do you see yourself ending up? I, I would never actually, I never actually had the confidence to say that I would end up, you know, somewhere, you know, in the higher echelons of, of whatever I chose to do. Um, but I always, I never ever had any doubt that I would always challenge myself to go for the next job that I was comfortable with doing. So I always went for a job and then got comfortable in that job and thought, okay, the next thing is a bit out of my comfort zone, but that's good. I'll go for that one. You know, just that next one and the next one. And that's, and that's how I've carried on all the way through. Just keep going until I find a position, until I get to a position where I actually think, this is probably as far as I can go, but I haven't actually reached that yet. So, you know, um, no, I didn't have the confidence to say I will be, and, I, and some women, obviously, they do have that confidence. Um, but in terms of, uh, actually, I wasn't a very confident child. I don't think it is about, that's why I say I don't think it's about confidence, because actually, as a child, I was a very shy child. I remember, I remember standing on a stage, I mean, how Ellen does it, I'm not sure at all, because I've always admired her over the years. But I remember standing on a stage in my secondary school when I had to do, um, a talk, a, a reading from a Bible or something in assembly. And I, I was shaking so much, I could hardly hold the book. And my legs were shaking so much. And the girls in front of me who were standing at the front were go, actually pointing at my legs, going, look at her legs shaking so much. <laughs> you know, and I wasn't really confident at all in that sense, you know, in confidence sense. I would never have believed I'd be sitting here today talking to you um, at that age. Um, and that's why I say it, it wasn't about confidence, it was about my expectation about what jobs I was going to get, you know, and, and my career. So, um, anyway, and, and there are certain things about the way I have gone about um, my whole career, my, my life in public service. Um, I think I would always force myself to do something, for example, in terms of... Um, that shaking and so on. I really thought to myself, how, how on earth am I going to get over that? Because you know, a lot of people will just retreat from it and not do that ever again because the, the likelihood of disaster was too great. But I've always thought to myself, I really must you know, put myself out there and uh, force myself to do things that, are, that I fear. I always have thought, 
I cannot just give in because I'm scared of doing something. You know, I just cannot do that. Um, and no matter how scared I am, I will, I will, try, to, I will try to deal with it and, and attempt to deal with it. So um, part of that, and I think Ellen did something like this today when she came in, actually. Um, part of that was to build relationships. And by building relationships, um, you know, as Ellen did when she came in, she spoke to all of you, you know, that's what I would try to do in my working career. So I think building relationships is one of the most important things. If somebody asked me what is the most important thing, that's what I would say. Because in building relationships, just like very many women say, you know, they have, they need maybe a support network. That's why we meet as women, isn't it? You know, I, I have this a bit of a sort of, you know, I'm a bit doubtful about sort of all women events, you know. <laughs> Um, we, we, we meet as women because we feel maybe there's a bit of a support needed, a network of support, isn't it? That's why a lot of groups uh, form. Um, you know, th there's that uh, element of support by meeting one another and, um, and talking about our issues and what we're facing and, and how we can improve things <laughs> and so on. Well, that's how I approached the whole of my career, not just with women, with people, you know, male, male, female. I would build relationships. So as, as I went through my career, I would um, build relationships right across South Wales, if I'm honest. Um, I say South Wales because I used to be part of a network um, of, of, um, of accountants um, who, who, you know, met with each other uh, periodically. And there was a, a tremendous, that's a, you know, South Wales, but even within my own organisation, I would build relationships. I would never, I would never, I would even build relationships with the people that other people didn't like and didn't want to build relationships with and couldn't be bothered. And, and the men would have, you know, maybe have arguments with people and be aggressive. I would never be like that. I would always try to be reconciliatory, uh, conciliatory, uh, you know, deal with things in a consensus way. And what happens then is that uh, you get that support. You get that support network from everybody, not just women, but you get that. So when you come to do things, and when you go for the next job, people are starting to say to her, yes, she's good, you know, she's good. She's, she's, and, they, and they support you because, well, they like you, um, and you've been respectful to them, even when others haven't. And, you know, and gradually, you know, you build a reputation of proving yourself in terms of the work. And then, um, you know, I think it's about thinking about um, potential value as opposed to immediate value. You know, some people will think, you know, you win this or win this battle or whatever. We try to think about, you know, keeping the and building these relationships will have some value for this organisation in in the future at some point. You know, so it's I, I felt, you know, you know that was very much part of how I moved on was was you know getting support from people. Um, and the other thing was, I stayed pretty local, you know, I, I stayed, you know, local. So my reputation, um, it, was, it was a risk at the time, because years ago, um, it was a big thing to stay, you know, the thing was to get on, was to move, you know, you had to move, move and get step, step up. And if you, didn't, if you didn't move, you were seen as not aspirational, you know, well, you know, even now, actually, it's so ingrained in me that even now when I'm saying it, I feel, I know, I've stayed in the same place all my life. And some people think, go, oh, how boring is that? You know, <laughs> you know, or, you know, there can't be much to you because you didn't go out there. You know, that, that's the general sort of feel to it, isn't it? Um, the reality is, I mean, I had by this time married. Um, I didn't have any children, but my, my husband worked locally. So to get two jobs, somewhere else was, you know, too much of an effort and, uh, you know, I, I was perfectly happy in this area. My, my family, my parents then were still in the area and, you know, that, that very solid grounding I had, um, you know, even though, you know, it's, it's, I, I read a book once, it was John Cleese, you know, psychology book, which talked about, um, you know, sorry, monkeys or something, you know, the best, absolutely best relationship is to have with your parents is to have sort of, you know, this very cosy very solid foundation, but you're sort of free to go off, 
you know, and two, three weeks later, you come back and you, you're refed from the centre, you know, in, in terms of confidence and support, and then you can go off again, you know, and you, you can keep, keep coming back. And I had that very, very much. And so, you know, I didn't want to move anywhere. Um, but I was really lucky in that the, the people that were influential in, the, in my career development saw people who moved about, as it happens, as, you know, potentially running away from, from more than any of their mistakes. And the people that stayed, they saw, and people like myself who stayed and saw things through, that's how they saw, they, how they saw me, as a sort of reliable person who'd stand up for what they'd done. Um, so I think that's how, and even the job that I've got today, I'm sure that, because I'm still, you know, still local, and I have got that through my reputation going before me, you know, because it's been, I've been very, um, you know, people uh, uh, know me through Wales, throughout Wales, you know, I'm well respected by the treasurers in the county council throughout Wales, and, you know, word of mouth goes around Wales, as we know, because Wales is very much like that. And so, you know, that has been a benefit to me, you know. Um, I think being, uh, I think being a woman does, you know, you do bring a different perspective into the job. Um, in many ways, you know, women tend to be more consultative and less dictatorial. Um, and I think that's, that's something, um, I've, I've really quite had it all in the sense that, you know, I've had, I've got two children. I actually had two children at the time of local government reorganization when I was, I was the lead, I was the lead officer in terms of the accounting, in terms of uh, local government reorganization in our area. I was in charge of the six treasurers that were in the area and uh, coordinating all the, all the, um, the work. And it was um, a, a horrendous time in terms of workload. Um, but I had two children at that time, and I also built a house at the same time. Uh, when I say I, my husband and I, um, and he took charge of most of that. And I'm not saying, you know, most of this was shared, obviously. Um, but, I mean, I remember a junior colleague saying to me um, after the, you know, gosh, you're, you know, you're superwoman. And I just laughed at the time. I laughed. And just said no, don't use station. But actually, looking back, see, to me, I, that it, that was just I just got on with it. But I do think that you know that I had some sort of resilience that got me through that. Um, uh, you know, looking back now, I had a very supportive mother, and my, my my father had unfortunately died, so she was able to take care of the children. I had crash facilities. These things, you know, become really important. Uh, a flexible crash facility, so a crash that will take your children from the nursery to the school to the nursery again, you know, during the day for you, and otherwise, which I didn't have. It took me three, three, three crashes to get to that point, which isn't very good for the, the child moving, um, but I had to, I had to do it. Um, you know, so that support network, I think, is one of the key things that has, you know, facilitated and allowed me to to, um, to, to get um, to just cope with life really in terms of getting through through my career um, I just really quickly because I, I know I'm going on um, I come into the fire service and this you know I got to a certain point into in my career and um, on, a, on a fairly technical level in terms of accounting um, coming into the fire service and I that step up there was step up and across was a major issue for me. Um, first of all, going from a fairly technical accounting job into the director's position, which is a leader of the organisation, um, and then moving from what I'd known in local, and I was quite confident in local government, moving across to a, a disciplined service, a new uniform service, um, very, very different. Um, the, uh, I was the only um, non-uniform person in the, in the executive board and the executive. Um, and, and being a woman as well. And when I first went there, I was very much pocketed as the director of finance. I'd come from a tactical role and I'd, uh, an accounting role, and I was pocketed as the director of finance, and everything was, you know, was only referred to me if it was financial, really. Um, developing, it's been a tremendous um, 
uh, experience over the last uh, few years at the fire service because I have moved from um, being that pocketed director of finance to being one of the executive board leading the organisation. And, you know, if you can cope, it's like, it's not just been, been coping with being a woman, but this transition to a uniform service was quite a major thing for me. It took me a long time to, um, you know, it, it's really like, I was really like starting again, as if I was starting again, like being a woman, but now I've got to try and understand how I fit into this operational organisation. But one of the key things I think we can learn from this is that I went on, on, on an executive, Fire Service has an executive leadership programme, and virtually there was two other women on it, again, non-operational women, um, but all the others were operational and men. And this was a huge turning point for me, and I think this, this is one of the key things that I think will, would help women, because I'm... Um, I went on that. I was quite nervous about going on this course, and I thought, you know, operational people were so much more clever than me. You know, they're, they're so authoritative, aren't they? You know what I mean? And they, you know, in, in terms of um, leadership, I worried about how I would sort of match um, the expectations and so on. But actually, it turned out, you know, once I got on it and we were, you know, we started off even on the first day with the exercises that we were having to do and so on. It just dawned on me that actually everybody coming into a management team, the executive board, has certain skills and certain abilities. That's why they're on the board. And my skills were not just financial. I suddenly realised that I actually had quite a lot of different skills that operational people don't have. Well, not all operational, obviously, it's a generalisation. But there were certain skills that I had that I could, that I had not just the financial thing, you know, the financial thing was a bit of a sort of, you know, side issue. I had skills coming from a corporate, big county council background into, uh, in terms of running an organisation, you know, and people management skills too. And that corporate thinking was, was not something that the operational people are used to. You know, they come up a rank and may, they get quite senior before they actually get used to an organisation at all. And this hadn't dawned on me at all. And all of a sudden, it sort of, it you know, it, it suddenly was like a big thing, you know, light, um, that actually I have as much right to be in this executive board as anybody else. I can contribute more than a lot of people in a lot of areas. Um, and it really did, you know, the, the, this is where I was talking about, you know, say all women things are not necessarily the best. They have their place, maybe, um, but sometimes, you know, that throwing me in to see what actually the, the operational men, um, yes, they are very good at some things, and they're not very good at other things, just like everybody else, you know? So I think, you know, it did really make me realise. Um, so I think that sort of mixed learning is actually really good for women. Um, I know I've gone on. Oh, sorry. Can, can I ask yes, you something very, very, very quickly? Yeah. Because I think what you've said is, is, is fascinating. You seem to have been from day one in, in your life determined to do this. Statistics are showing us that, that not many women are like that. Right? <laughs> do you think then, coming back to a point that you said at the beginning about being taught, are, are, you, are you saying that there is a route by which women should be taught? to think in a certain way, mm. or taught to realise that they have skills that they didn't know that they had and were afraid were not sufficient. Yes, I do. I do think there's so a role for that. At what level is that teaching going I think, to take place? To be honest with you, I'm actually asked now to be meant to <coughs> mentor right. the operational people, because even they, they are beginning to see, you know... Um, but on, mentor them on what? Um, because they see, you know... In, in the operational side, you know, you've, you've got people who think very much alike, you know, and they get promoted because they think alike. Do you see what I'm saying? They promote it because they think alike to the next person and so on. So, actually, on the executive board, I find, you know, people will ask me things because, because I am a woman because and because different. I di I'm different. Okay. And sometimes, you know, sometimes, which I must say is very satisfying, is when, you know, we you know, have a, a 12 angry men, I don't know if you've seen that film, <laughs> but you have a 12 angry men moment when all the operational people 
uh, agreeing something. And I go, hang on, what about so and so? And they and they and they manage to change all their minds, and they all go in a different direction because of something I've said, which is really really satisfying, you know. Because um, thank you very much, Jeff but you know, so, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. I think there were lots of really interesting things there, um, and from somebody who is probably a little bit different, but I sense has the same determination um, to do what she has done. Can I now introduce Rachel Flanagan, who is award winning. Um, and she started her business at, at 18. She employs 90 staff, possibly more now. Okay, it's gone up to 110 since I last looked at the web. But she actually defined herself as a messy teenager who couldn't be bothered with school. Um, she was also a competitive swimmer. That might give us a clue as to the, her nature. And I think, you know, um, Elizabeth talked a lot about the nature of us and, and who we are that makes us. So, um, Rachel, if you could give us your experience. Okay. Yeah, so obviously um, I left, I went to Gosainan College uh, when I was 16, um, left Ponte de Lice Comprehensive School, sort of did quite well at my GCSEs, and then when I went into college I was sort of pulled more into the social life, to be quite honest, and uh, going down the shop instead of going to school and, you know, doing all the, the things with all my new friends. Um, so for me... Going to college was obviously a big challenge, really, and I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, I actually took business, media, art, and IT, and I failed business. <laughs> I remember um, for about a year afterwards, I told my mother that I, that I had a C, and I didn't actually tell her that I had a U. <laughs> um, until, so, obviously, I, I did my A-levels. Um, I still haven't picked up my certificates. It is something that, to me, it wasn't important and it still isn't now. Um, and I remember saying to my mother, um, I'm going to set up a cleaning business. And my mother's a, you know, a, she's a teacher. She's worked in the school for 27 years. And she just looked at me and she thought, you what? What are you going to do? And I said, yeah, I'm going to set up my own cleaning business. Um, so that really was, my mother sort of thought, right, that's a phase that she's going to go through year out and um, then she can go to uni and, and off she goes because obviously my, my mother was brought up about university is everything. Um, so obviously I, I, I went through the first year when I started my business, I, I started to employ people. And I had to learn quite a lot, obviously, at a, at a young age. I was, um, you know, I was 18 in May, so I was one of the youngest, really, in my year. Um, and I had to deal with a lot of people. I think, especially when you're younger, a lot of people sort of said, you're not, you're not going to do that. You know, you won't make a business at being, you know, a, a cleaner. Um, but for me, that I actually took that, and that actually drove me, you know, to, to want to succeed more, to prove people wrong. Um, and that stayed with me since, to be honest, uh, something which I always sort of think failure is not an option. And, you know, if the plan A didn't work, well, what's plan B? Um, so obviously seven years on now, um, I'm 25, I'm aging a bit. <gasps> and, um, <laughs> and we do employ, it's just over 110 staff at the moment. Um, we cover sort of, all of South and sort of West Wales. But our businesses have sort of changed quite a lot over the last couple of years. I mean, when I was 21, uh, we got invited to go to London to Claridge's and uh, we were really, really lucky um, in winning the UK Young Entrepreneur Awards. And for me, that was um, a sort of a life-changing moment, really. It sort of sounds a bit over the top, but it was. And the, the whole room was probably, you know, I was the youngest person in the room. There was no women in the room. It was sort of, you know, all men, probably 50 plus. And I was sort of there, you know, sitting on my own, sort of 21, thinking I'm never going to win this award. And I actually went into the, the bathroom and I was speaking to the toilet assistant. And my mother comes running in saying, you've won, you've won. <laughs> so obviously I came back. Um, and I remember travelling back the next day and, you know, GMTV were ringing us, uh, we were on ITV News. It was literally a life-changing sort of thing for me personally as well. Um, and that's when I thought I could really, really make something out of this business here if I, if I, know, if, you know, if I know what I'm going to do in, in the sort of, and get more business skills. 
So, so that's what I did really. I pushed myself. Um, I read books after books. I went on courses. Um, and I try to hang around with people that are better than me. And that's something that I still do to date now is I always think, you know, am I going to get something out of that person? Am I going to learn from that person? And, and you do outgrow them. You know, it's quite natural. Um, and I think having those people around you in business, especially when you're younger, it is key. Um, and obviously, you know, obviously I'm like a sponge where I want to learn all the time. So where the business is now, obviously, um, being a woman in business, I would sort of say, and, and obviously being young is something that, you know, I do want to touch upon because not just being a woman, obviously, is difficult in business. It's also being young. You know, the first time I walked into a networking group, I think I was definitely the only person under 25 who was, um, a, you know, a young girl, and I was 18. And I sort of went over to the coffee stand and thought, what, am I, what on earth am I supposed to do? There's all men here with their suit, suits on, and I probably couldn't even afford to buy a suit at the time. I thought, what am I supposed to do? Um, but a lot of people, they sort of, you know, I suppose they would let that, let that sort of incident put them off, really. But if anything, I thought, no, I, when, when I go back next time, I'm going to make sure that people know who I am and you know, try and push myself each time. And, and that's what I did really, is every single time I went back and I went back and, you know, I thought, well, they're not too bad, you know, I can speak to them. And um, so I learned quite a lot in doing that, that sort of um, on the networking side. Um, recently, in the last sort of couple of months, um, uh, I, I got married last year. My husband, he was in the army and uh, quite um, a, a senior job in the army and uh, we had to make quite a big decision as in really, you know, right, are we going to actually make this work of travelling to Devon every single weekend um, or, you know, where where can we go? Because obviously I was sort of, you know, business minded, wanted to push the business further. Um, so he's now actually left the army, uh, which is obviously a, a quite a big thing after, after 10 years of being in the army. And he's joined now my business as an, as an operations manager, which I absolutely love, to be honest, because he is OCD. Um, so, but he's my first male in my top management team. You know, there's eight of us. And um, it was quite funny because, um, especially because he is from the army as well, uh, one of our accounts ladies, you know, she came uh, chuckling in the other day and she was like, woo, woo, woo. And I was like, what's wrong? And she was saying, Danny's going to put that cup in the bin because I had left a cup on my desk all night and for the next day. And she said, you know, because obviously in the army, if you leave anything, they just put it in the bin. And I was thinking, well, this might not be too bad, actually, having <laughs> someone, you know, coming in here and giving us a little bit of order in the office because obviously we should be clean in the office. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously for me, you know, it's, it's a big thing when, you know, your husband turns around and says, I've decided to leave the army and, you know, obviously our business is our life, is everything. You've got to work so hard in business. I think sometimes people think, oh, you're 25, you've got 110 staff, must be wonderful. But yeah, they don't realise that you work 60 plus hours and the amount of issues and, you know, the sort of turning in your sleep at night and, you know, having a notepad next to your bed every night so you can just get, you know, everything off uh, what you need to uh, just to go to sleep. But also it does obviously come with a plus as well where you can uh, work it um, around your life as well. You know, you can take holidays, but it, it is literally all about the people in your business. And it's something, especially the last year, we've doubled in size in the last 12 months. Um, so obviously we're going through fast growth at the moment and growth is, you know, I, I sort of call it, it's like a beast in itself to control um, because you're, you're learning so much. There's so much change, but I thrive on change. I love it. But there's people in your team that, you know, don't like change. So as a leader, you have to support them and, you know, hand, uh, hold your team uh, through to the, the end goal. Um, I've sort of, yeah, I've said obviously that, you know, um, my team is obviously all women, my top level team is all women and one, one man at the moment. Um, and 80% of our cleaners are female. Um, I'm still not 
I would absolutely love to have more male cleaners, but they just are not the same as, as women. Um, but they, you know, obviously you, you do find them as well, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but obviously 80% cleaners just, just shows really. Um, I do find that being a woman in business, especially the last sort of year for me, I've actually tried to push myself more uh, where we're now getting to the point where we've started to go into do tendering and much larger contracts something which before I was sort of sort of a dreamt of and um, last month we went our first ever you know major massive uh, sort of client and that, that to me was one of those massive ticks sort of thinking right this is it now we can be with the big boys um, but what I learned from that experience is sitting around a, a a big um, conference table with all men who are sort of, uh, you know, sales directors and, and big owners in the large cleaning firms is actually, uh, you know, I wanted to push myself on being the only woman around that uh, table. And I think that, you know, especially in cleaning, I, you know, I, I am quite uh, sort of biased, but I do think in a lot of detail compared to maybe what a man would when we're tendering for a, for a project, uh, for a, um, a new contract. And when I asked the woman, you know, why did you decide to choose us? She, she said, obviously, we were a lot more personal. Uh, we were a lot, lot more detailed and a lot more reactive than the other competitors. And that, to me, sort of gave me the confidence now to sort of think big on, on, our, on our next tenders that we go for. Um, I think, again, sort of the type of person I am, I'm a very goal-orientated person. Um, I always think about, um, you know, what goals we can achieve in our business. But to achieve goals, you have to have your team behind you and they have to believe in that goal. So I think, obviously, um, you know, like we've got a goal at the moment where we know we, we, we want to move office. So um, we, know, we know we have a target board and we know how many weekly hours of cleaning we need to do to achieve, from a, to get new contracts in, to achieve to get that new office. And it's not just a driving force for me, but every week when we fill in the board, it's like this big target thing, there's a picture of the office. Um, that, then that sort of pushes our team as well to you know, um, help us expand as well. Um, so I think... What I've learned over the last sort of couple of years, I think the last three years, I would sort of say the last three to four years, I've really tried to develop myself as a leader. Um, I, you know, I have no problem with delegating whatsoever <laughs> now. And before, I, I wanted to keep it close. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to grow this business if I don't, you know, uh, delegate out to other people. But I think it's also made me realise how special and how important your your team is around you. And that's about having relationships, it's about having a laugh, it's about having it's about celebrating big wins. Um, next week we're going go-karting and just to have a little bit of time as a team together because we are a very busy business. Um, and I just think, yeah, I mean, if, if anything, right now, being a woman in business, I, I think is a, is a good time and more people should try and do it. Thank you. You've been uh, quite an inspiration, Rachel. <laughs> Um, have you uh, have you been back to see your business teacher in school? <laughs> well, um, is there any business teachers here? <laughs> um, Feel free. Although there is the World Wide Web to worry about. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, it's quite funny because my sister is actually seven years younger than me, and she went. To the, she obviously has gone to the same college that I went to. And um, apparently, they talk about me now in the business class <laughs> as this, you know, thing. And I was thinking, oh, I didn't even go to that class, you know. I, I, I am so. interested in one thing that you, you went to see your mum, and you said, "I want to, I want to start a cleaning business, right?" And you know, part of the, the thing that we are on about here is to inspire more people to do that. Can you actually remember what it was that inspired you in the first place to think that you could do it, and and in what way can you sort of bottle that? For, for, the, for the women that we are trying to inspire now? Um, I think, well, obviously, um, 
I I was coming home really. I was coming home and my mother was having a cleaner. Oh, okay. And I was coming home and I was thinking, oh, she's left early. She hasn't done the time that you know my mother's paid her for. Okay. I'll end up doing it and I'll have a bit of pocket money for myself. So that's what I started to do. And then I actually started to enjoy cleaning, even though I was a messy, you know, t- teenager, typical no. teenager, um, where you probably look in and you think, oh God, I'm not cleaning that room. Um, but that that sort of, for me, that's how I got my idea, was thinking, well, wouldn't it be good if you had staff out there and then you had someone managing those staff so they wouldn't be able to leave early and do this and you could check on them and you could do all these sort of things. Um, but my, my father's in business right? and um, he was he's more sort of like me, where he left school when he was 14 um, and he went and sort of started his own business there. So for me... Um, my father, when I went to go and tell my father I went to go and start his business, he thought he was, you know, wonderful. He thought he was brilliant. But then my mother was like, oh, my gosh, no, you can't, you can't. Oh, you've got to go to uni. And I was like, no, I just failed business. And how can I go to uni <laughs> so let's to do business? <laughs> you know, so, yes, and okay. obviously, yeah. Thank you very much, Rachel. Cheers. Um, right, moving on to Paula, um, who runs Women Making a Difference. And we've already, I think, spoken heard two women who do make a difference. Now, the, the aim of making a difference is to increase the number of women who have the skills, the ability, and the confidence, and the mindset to become leaders in their communities, um, and to make them decision makers um, at all levels of public and political life in Wales. So that's a big ask, given the statistics, yeah, Paula. Um, and I, I think we've, you know, we've discussed some of the um, characteristics of successful women. So could you outline to me you know, a little bit about what you do and what you think are the secrets? Oh, and you need to put your mic up. You'd think oh, I'd know, oh, wouldn't oh, you, oh, in the media oh, business? Is that okay? Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah? I don't usually need a mic. Okay, my name's Paula Manley, and um, I have a very different background, I think, to the other two, that um, I left school with very few qualifications, and I'm kind of looking at women I already know, because I found this very difficult to write about myself. I usually present about the project, which I'm much more comfortable about. Okay, I left school with very few qualifications. I'd been brought up um, in a family of three girls. My father died when I was 12, And so uh, for most of my teenage years, I was brought up in a single parent household. Um, In those days, uh, there was no aspiration in my family uh, for any of us to go on to further education. Uh, We were girls and the best thing we could do was go out and get a job, contribute to the household um, and marry a husband who would keep us. Um, And so what happened in reality? Well, the three of us went on to have quite successful careers, uh, all in different ways. My one sister was a hairdresser, but she ended up owning her own salon. Uh, The other one uh, worked in in an estate agent and became one of the partners. I was the youngest, the baby in the family, and always different, and always the one that got away with everything, really. Um, And so I always knew I wanted to do something that was going to make a difference. And so I started my working life uh, with VCS, Voluntary Community Service, and that was over 30 years ago uh, when we were in St. Mary's Street. Well, actually, we started up in Charles Street, went to St. Mary's Street. And um, there I met some very, very inspirational uh, people. They were the movers and the shakers, and in those days, we really were political. And uh, they were the days of uh, the Maggie Thatcher marches, um, and life was fun. Um, I married one of those uh, radicals. He works for a trade union, and my mother said I would end up in a garret. (laughs) She was convinced. Um, Well, I did go on, and I did get myself an education, um, including, I remember, uh, I was studying for a postgrad certificate in professional development, and I had three children around me while I was on the computer, desperately trying to get the latest assignment out to the deadline. Uh, There was many a tear shed over my education. Um, And so when my children came to grow up, you know, I was determined, probably like your mother, that they would have um, 
and education that they wouldn't have to struggle in. Only one of them's gone on to university, well, done anything academically. Okay, so um, what I really wanted to talk about uh, today was the, in my life's journey, uh, the women who have inspired me. And um, the women that stand out uh, as my inspirations uh, were, um, in the first instance, they were the peace women of Northern Ireland. Uh, my background is Irish Catholic. Um, and so uh, that organisation, it was born out of a wave of grief and anger that followed the deaths of three children. Um, it, were, it happened that the... Um, I'll try and make it a quick story, but the, uh, there was... Um, a young Republican uh, was driving a car fast down the road and he had a passenger and he was being pursued by soldiers. Um, and the soldiers shot at the car, killed the driver. The driver lost control and ploughed into a family of uh, the mother and four children. Two died instantly, one the next day. Um, and the mother committed suicide 41 months later because uh, she was so devastated at the loss of her children. But what came out of that grief was um, that uh, women were, in our, were up in arms and uh, they wanted to uh, end the violence. And so one woman, uh, Betty Williams, she rang the local newspaper and gave out a telephone number and said, please contact me if you want to do anything about it. And actually, the mother's sister, uh, she went to the television station and she made a broadcast and contacted Betty Williams, and uh, the rest is history. They went on and they changed um, uh, a lot of how, uh, you know, the troubles were dealt with in Ireland um, and went on and won the Nobel Peace Prize. The second group of women who have inspired me along that journey were the women in Wales who supported the uh, minor strike. And of course, you know, it was women who really were the heart of that strike. They uh, joined the picket lines, they marched at rallies, they provided food parcels. Um, and they weren't only protesting at the closure, uh, or that, you know, they were opposing the closure of the 28 South Wales pits, but they also were protesting against the threat to their communities because they knew what was going to happen to the valleys if those uh, pits were to close. And um, an example of what came out of the, uh, the women's, um, uh, the, the, the women who supported the minor strike um, is the Dub Workshop, which is very close here, and I'm sure many of you know of it, um, uh, in Neath. Um, and that was started again by the women who, uh, you know, they, they supported the strike and then said we have to do something for our communities and they still function today, uh, delivering training, education, support services uh, in their area. And so for me, the people who have inspired me are um, just ordinary women with ordinary lives who saw a problem, who had to deal with it. Um, and that's been my inspiration really and I hope it's the one that continues to drive me um, in wanting to ensure that ordinary women have the chance to be the hearts, more than the hearts of their community, that they can be the leaders in that community, that they can have a voice in what services are provided, um, that they can be those decision makers. Um, and um, uh, so I started uh, with Women Making a Difference, following the um, publication of the Who Runs Wales report that what, what was then the EOC published uh, back prior to 2005. Um, and if I can just take you quite quickly through some of the stats now about Who Runs Wales. Um, we know uh, that the National Assembly of Wales led the way. It was the first world perfect gender balance in 2003. However, we haven't kept up with that kind of gender balance. Um, and if, I, if we look at the UK government, if we look at Wales and the UK government, in 1929, Megan Lloyd George became our first female MP. We've only ever returned 13 women MPs in Wales. How bad is that? 13 in total since 1929. 
Um, and in fact, the sad thing was we did have eight and in the last election, it went down to seven. We only have seven women out of 40 who return to uh, the UK government from Wales. Um, and the Electoral Reform Society have done a piece of work called Counting Women In, and they say at the current rate of change, a girl child born today will be drawing a pension before she has an equal say in the government of her country. Um, with the National Assembly, as I say, we did start with a fantastic uh, gender balance, and we now have two women leading uh, Welsh political parties. But there was a serious concern in the last election that those numbers would go down. Uh, uh, below the critical mass of 30%, um, and can we sustain it into the future? And that's something we seriously have to look at. Uh, we've recently had a local government election. Only 25% of, government, of, count, governors, of councillors in Wales are, are, are women, um, and that's really after quite a lot of effort has been put into trying to change those figures. Um, and I think I heard Rosemary saying earlier, you know, how ideal... Uh, that role of a councillor would be for many women. Um, why aren't they taking them up? We can talk about that later, but why aren't they taking them up? Um, if I can just give you again a couple of uh, stats on that. In Swansea, actually, Swansea comes out on top. Swansea has 28 women out of 72. Uh, Cardiff's next with 27 out of 75. You know, in Merthyr, we still only have Actually, I think it's four uh, women out of uh, those councillors. It doubled from two. And in Anglesey, well, Anglesey um, is probably a different kettle of fish, but they did only used to have two. I think, uh, I may be wrong, but I think there are only two female BME councillors. Only two out of our 22 council leaders are female in Cardiff and Ceredigion. Um, and only 23% of local government chief executives are women, even though 68% of, of the workforce are women. Um, but, and I think it's been said earlier, you know, this isn't just about being women. This is about race, and it's about uh, our age, and it's about sexuality, it's about disability, it's about all of these things that really need to be considered uh, when we look at our political life, when we look at our community leaders, when we look at who are making the decisions for us. Are they representing us? Uh, barriers, we were asked to look at barriers. And yes, I have experienced barriers in my own career. I admit that most of them have been uh, inside me. And like the other two, it's been my lack of confidence that's completely... Um, stop me from putting myself forward. Others that I've worked with, uh, a lot of the women have gone on um, and they've had very successful careers and they're chief executives and they're doing very well. Um, I've always been the one who looked at that job description and said, I can only do 60% of it, so I won't be applying for it. And also, if it's got a big salary attached to it, whoa, there's no way am I ever going to apply for that job because I couldn't be worth all that money. Um, and so, um, uh, at the beginning of my career, it was my education. Then it was, you know, my three children. Um, and now I'm a granny. And one of my working days, I give up to look after my beautiful, beautiful granddaughter. I have three boys, so you can imagine what it's like for me to have a granddaughter. Um, but you know what? This, t like today, is my granny day. Um, for me to be here, I've had to bring my son over from Bath this morning so that he could look after the baby this morning and my husband's leaving work early this afternoon. For us women, it's never easy. It's never an easy journey, even at my stage of life where you would think I should be having an easy time of it. No, you know, I'm still juggling my work, my life um, and everything else around it. And that's how women are. But when we do juggle, we do it very well. Um, there are barriers for women. And uh, the barriers that women have highlighted for us um, when we've been going through our programme is lack of confidence. It's always top. Um, the main thing is that they're just not really aware of what those public offices are. They just don't... Nobody tells them what a public office are, where they're advertised, where they can find them, how you can stand for councillor. Um, 
and uh, they do have a lack of political education, work-life balance we've already touched on. Motivation is different for women. Um, women aren't driven by money, then they're driven by wanting to make a difference in their community. Um, and also, you know, the, 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 their, their thoughts about um, uh, uh, how they want to spend their time, do they want to spend it in a, in a room full of men who are pale and male? Um, I'm not going to go on too long um, now because I have got other things I can say, but I am aware that time's um, uh, got the best of us. Paula, thank you very, very much for that insightful. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad you went last because you kind of bring it all back to the reason why we're here. Because, you know, we've looked at... We've looked at examples here of women who are confident, who, who, who do feel that there haven't been that many barriers right, to, to doing what they're doing. So let's get to the crux of the matter is why, I mean, you, you've, you've said that there are women who are not self-confident. We've alluded to things like that mentoring and education would be good, that role models would be good. Can we, uh, can we open it to the floor, please? I'm sure lots of you have, are itching to, to ask something of these ladies or just to make a point about how you feel um, and how we can progress. How can we change those statistics? Um, and, and is it just a matter of people that don't know where to look for the ads to find out what roles there are? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Mike. Uh, yeah. Could you wait for you? Sorry. Could you also say who, who you are? Uh, where are you from? My name's Rian. My name's Rian Connick. I work for the National Federation of Women's Institutes. Um, it was a point you raised, Elizabeth, about you 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 feel that it's not about confidence, but about expectation. And I just wanted to raise the point, really, uh, or ask. Expectation means different things to different women, really. And, you know, I'm aware through the work that WI does that there's lots of young women out there with hardly any expectation at all. And how do we address that, really? How do we get them to expect more from their lives and from their careers and so on, rather than just accepting, you know, things as they are. Yeah. I mean, it is a tough one because I think it does start very early on in life, you know. Um, and so whatever it is that we need to do, we need to do in a national government sense very early on. So either, you know, some sort of um, initiative even at crash level, even before prior th three-year-old level, I think, to be honest with you. Um, but certainly, once you get into primary school, you know, it really has to be that level, you know. Um, and it has to be a very specific thing, I think, as well. An incentive, not a gen, you know, because, because you can't, it, especially to start off with, to kickstart something, you've got, you can't have a general something or other. You've got to have something very specific, you know. I don't agree with things, if I'm absolutely honest, you know, things like, you know, select lists for women and that sort of stuff. Because I, it, just because it goes against the grain, because I like to prove my worth, you know, and so, and, and I've won the job, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. But I can see, in order, in the very short term, in order to kickstart some, you know, potentially something like that happening at an early age. But, you know, not maybe again just for women, just for, you know, just for, you know, young kids, male and female, it has to be something specific very early on, you know, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a co and you know, continuous, you know, not a one-off thing people forget, don't they? It has to be something that's regularly instilled at that early age, I think. Mm. It, it's, Rachel, you know, you, you're, you've been there, you were in the crash um, mm. less time than the rest of us were, right? I mean, what, what do you reckon... Rian was saying that there are people whose expectations are not great. Mm -hmm. From your experiences when you were at school and, and, and your, your, your friends that saw what you did um, and have done, what would you say was the level of expectation of girls your, you know, when, when you were in, growing up? Um, I think obviously when you're, when you're younger, you're sort of, your expectations is really sort of what your parents tell you to do. Um, so obviously if your parents have been brought up and they've gone to university, 
then obviously they want you to follow that path and to have a good education. If you haven't got parents, which their parents didn't teach them the sort of the rights and wrongs and maybe the way that we should really do it, then I think it's very difficult because you've been brought up in that, ho that home environment where the parents themselves have never wanted to push themselves. So really you have no role model to sort of think, you know, like for me it's, I always joke now that I'm my father's business mentor and he comes to me and asks me questions, but we have a bit of fun with that. But if your parents aren't like that, where they're on benefits and they can't be bothered to, you know, go and get a job and things, and especially in, in our line of work, I see that day in, day out, where people do not turn up for interviews. They have to go and they phone you because obviously they have to go for their benefits and things but they're not actually interested in working. Now, if that's going on in the house environment, then it's very, very difficult. And I think, you know, that's the problem. So, okay, we've, we've seen that it's something that could be done in education and it's going to be something that mentoring in, in, for parents and role models. Has anybody else got any comments on that? I'm from Communities First and uh, we, I'm working in a South Wales Valley in uh, the Upper Avon Valley. And I think... Um, I'd, I'd just like to say that we, we work with disadvantaged women. We do a lot of work with women who have no aspirations. And I have to praise my team. They're absolutely fabulous at getting women to believe that they can do more. Um, we are challenged, I think, as Communities First to try and get more women involved in public service. We have three male councillors in our valley and that does make a difference, I think, to the way women are perceived. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can do more to get women more engaged in the involvement side of partnership in communities first areas. Um, I, think, I think we have a challenge there. We're doing a lot to educate women, to get them on that ladder of education so that they understand policy. Um, and when they do, they're very driven because the point that was made earlier is women want to make a difference. Mm. And if we look at our communities, it's the women in the communities that are doing mo most of the moving and shaking. It's the women who are changing things. It's the women who are in the voluntary <coughs> sector in the main. Um, and, and I think we've got potential at the moment with public services being scaled down that if tendering is going on, that we should be encouraging women in business and enterprise to take up those opportunities mm -hmm. um, that aren't available at the moment because they're monopolized. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunities ahead um, and we're in a position really to make a big difference in helping people take up those opportunities. Thank you for making that point. Yes. Um, Beverly Pohl de Huarateg. Um, those of you who know Huarateg know that we've been in around for 20 years now, it's our 20th anniversary this year, and it was only back in March, International Women's Day, that we launched our 20th anniversary celebration here in the National Waterfront Museum. And we had a celebration here, and we had an exhibition here for three months, just celebrating women and Quarateg's achievements. What I want to say really for Quarateg is that um, we came in, in 20 years ago when there was a recession, there was a, a need for women's skills to be utilised in the labour market. And I look at Paula now, because I work with Paula. And over those years now, we've seen some peaks and troughs. We're just commissioning research now, a longitudinal study now of 20 years of women in Wales. it would be interesting now to see what comes out of that. But the point I want to make really is that Quarateg has worked very closely with Welsh Government over the years with core funding to make a difference to women in Wales. And we've used our core funding as a platform, really, to access other initiatives. Now, currently, we're running an Agile Nation project. It's called Agile Nation, funded under European Social Fund through convergence in the convergence areas of Wales. That initiative is worth £12.5 million, much funded by Welsh Government, a huge commitment by Welsh Government now to equality and women's role in Wales. Now, we... When we put together the programme, we wanted to make sure that we created opportunities for women to progress into decision-making roles. What we found was that although we wanted 
to work with women at the very top of their careers, like Elizabeth, who were as you know, aspirational, we found that the need was greatest at entry level, at the first level of supervision, the first level of management. We set a target of 2,800 women going through that program. We've reached about 2,000 women now. Level two, ILM, first line management qualification. If we're measuring the outcomes now, apart from the, the number crunching for European Funding Office, we're also measuring their progression routes now, where they're going on from that initial, fund, initial investment in funding and the additional income that they're generating through being qualified. This is a huge project, but it's, a, you know, it's starting now. What we need to do now is build on this now going forward and make sure that we keep the momentum going so those women who have aspirations now are, are supported going forward now into the decision-making roles as their careers progress. So watch this space. We've also been very inclusive. We've, got, we've created women from you know, Filipino communities. Lucy, my colleague here, has worked on the programme. We've actually had a lot of Polish women on the programmes in different parts of Wales, and they've actually done their assignments through, you know, through their, their, their mother tongue, and we've had them translated. So we've provided a very inclusive service. What I want to make sure, really, is the fact that Quarateg still has a long way to go. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done, and it's looking now and getting those women into the more the leadership roles, the decision-making roles, uh, to make a difference in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, good, good luck with that, and congratulations on your success so far. Can I just ask Lynn? I'm going to pick on somebody now. Well, only because I know that you've done a thesis on this, and I think anybody who's done a thesis on something will have something to say. I am one of the people who, way back in 2005, Paul and I have been friends for a long time. We met in a book group. That's how we started off. And she told me about the project Women Making a Difference. And she said, you want to think about it, Lynn? And I thought, hmm, do I? I've retired. Do I want to do this? It was the best thing I ever did. But if I could just briefly tell you, the difference that Women Making a Difference has made for women is that it deals with all women. I quite respect what you say about introducing women at different levels, but this reaches the woman who's stuck at home who is too frightened to come out, who hasn't got the confidence. It builds the confidence in that woman, and you suddenly find that woman who would sort of put her head down in a meeting, not speak, is now standing in the front, giving the talk, quite happy, going on to be a local councillor, making a difference. She's made a difference to her life, which as a consequence makes a difference to her children's life. A happy, confident mother produces a happy, confident child. No matter what you do as a mum, it doesn't make any difference. My mum was appalled by me, absolutely appalled. I was a nightmare. But there we are. I think she'd be quite happy if she was looking down. See, I, had, I did make a success. Anyway, getting back to barriers and this dissertation, as a consequence of doing Women Making a Difference, the project introduced you to other courses. If women wanted to, they can go on and take a university course. How many women would even dream? Some of those women, go to university, me, do that. Many women would never think about it. Not only did I go on to do that, but then somebody suggested, oh, you should go on, Lynn, you should go on and study. Should I? What did I do? I go on to Oxford and do a master's. Mind you, it nearly killed Paula, nearly <laughs> killed me, nearly killed everybody else, but I did it. And the, the dissertation I did is, why are there so few women in Wales in public life, what are the barriers? The first one that I did research on professional women, and I did research on women at home, all sorts, different women. I interviewed Rian, I interviewed Paula, I introduced a professor in the university, I did the leader of the equality, I, I did all sorts of people. And the first thing most women said, I wasn't confident. I didn't have the confidence in myself. And when you look back, we are slightly mean. Shall I do it? Yes, it's great if you've got it and you carry on, but not all of us have got it. So confidence is a huge barrier. How do we overcome it? Can I ask a quick question yeah. there regards men then? I mean, do men not go for public office because they lack confidence? There are some men who don't go for public office, yes. So, so what, what is it about our upbringing as, as women that makes us less confident that men are, because men will just it's do the it? The next barrier is, is the time. The first of all is confidence, mm -hmm. and the second one is childcare. Yeah. That, that was the second barrier. 
and you're not educated to do it. Mm. We. Carol Lincoln from Energy Saving Trust. Uh, what I said was, I think most men I in public life have an excellent, supportive woman behind them. And I'm not saying that many women perhaps don't have a, a supportive partner, but it isn't a traditional role, perhaps, uh, for, for women in public service. That, that's, that's something that springs to mind. I think Everybody needs yes, a wife. I'd actually exactly love to have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, do you want to make another point, Lynn? Yeah. Because you need the microphone if you don't. Oh. Time? Child, child care. Child, child care, care, right? Knocking, knocking on from child, you don't need that. Well, you, you, you need it for... Oh, knocking on from childcare, then you're responsible for adults. You know, you, many of us now yes, have got yes, elderly care yes. to look after. So it was confidence, childcare, mm. and time. Those were the three that came out most of all. So, so therefore, is there an answer to those problems? Okay, confidence we can try and do our best to sort out, right? But the ch time, the childcare? The childcare can be overcome if meetings are done at a more convenient time. Mm -hmm. The women said... Yes, yes. And, but, but if the meeting was in a time, you know, not 8 o'clock in the evening in the local place, oh. I can't go then, I'm looking yeah. after children. So can they be more family friendly? That was one of the reasons for meetings. Women can't find... I do think costs, though. I think costs are charged. Quite a agree, costs. That, that we work with. Totally. Um, it's, it, you know, even if we have something in the day, Sorry. they can't, uh, they can't access any of these courses without childcare. Affordable and accessible. accessible. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Going yeah. Now, actually. Um, yes. I was going to ask the question are we leaving it too late? Um, should we be working with our younger women now Absolutely. coming through? You Absolutely. know, making, you know, creating opportunities for them, yeah. embedding, um, you know, community service, if you like, within their PSE classes in, in school, so that they become more attuned to the process, as, as Paula said, the system, how the, how the community works, you know, yeah. how, how local government works. Yeah. So we, yeah. we politicise them with a small P at an early age, so mm -hmm. they realise they can make a difference. And I think, you know, certainly, you know, from where I come, I'd like to see more engagement with younger women and start yeah. training them and developing them as they progress through their careers. So we mentor them you know, in a professionally, but also mentor them, you know, in, in their in civil life as well. Yes, okay, yeah. Can I say something? I absolutely, totally agree with everything that Bev said. What concerns me, though, is that we educate our young men, because 75% of them are going to be the decision makers mm -hmm. if we stick with today's statistics, and if they don't change their attitude, they don't open the women doors to women, we've had it. And actually, it's one of the things... Um, that I always feel very disappointed about is that men aren't engaging with the women into public life debate, with the women's representation debate. We talk to women. And while we continue to talk to women, we all agree in this room there won't be change. We'll all go out and we will all continue to feel, as we did when we walked through the door, very passionate about it. We need to change men's minds so that men are in this room yeah, well, and men so are supporting Rosemary, us. Rosemary, here's a challenge for you. Can you organise the next one with lots of men here? Sorry, no disrespect it's to the men. It's not just a women's issue. <laughs> you know, how, 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 do you, how do you feel? Can I, can I ask the presiding officer, are you allowed to speak? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm the presiding officer. I can do anything I like. I think. <laughs> I I so I'm told. So I'm told. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm... You know, I'd love to speak. I think I'm here to listen to what other people are saying. Yeah, but we're, but, we're, we're putting questions But I think, I think um, you now what we need to do is to get the women uh, is the old stand, you know, united to stand, divided we fall. Absolutely. And um, what I'm looking for here, and I think we had a fantastic example here today of women who, you know, are real exemplars. You've done it through sheer blooded mindedness because you want to move up the ladder. You've done it through, you know, you want to prove somebody wrong. You had a fantastic role model in your father. And you've done it, you know, the hard way. Uh, and, and I think everybody here can connect with, with one of you. Um, that's what we need to do. We need role models. And all of us here, you're all, you've all done exceptional stuff, whether you like to admit it or not. But you think about it, you have. 
And what I want to do is to get you to hold your hand out to another sister to help her up the ladder. Um, so it's a case of getting the women to stand up and say, yeah, we need it. But, the but point, then but the we point need to get the men. The we yeah. need to get, but once we've done that, then we need to get the men. You're absolutely right, because mm. they are in most places of... Uh, um, you know, making decisions. I mean, can, can I ask, you know, the response that you get from the men in the Welsh Assembly about this issue, what is their attitude to what you're trying to do now, you know? Well, the majority of them are very supportive uh, because, you know, they understand that 50% of their electorate are, wom uh, are women mm -hmm. and therefore they need to connect with those women. So they're doing it for political reasons? I'm not, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't care why they do it, to be yeah, honest, as long as, as, long they, as they do, do it. it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Sorry, Sorry it's not for me to... Uh, Anybody else? Uh, how about the ladies on the table in the back there, Vincent? Well, I've been very quiet so far. Yeah. Anybody there want to make a point? Oh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sue Jones. I'm a local councillor in Swansea City. Um, I, I understand all that you're saying about the confidence because it isn't easy to get up and speak in front of people and I'm shaking now. But the way that I actually got into local government was actually making a difference in my local school, where we had outside toilets. And I actually went to see Gareth Waddell as a PTA member and got on the board in that way um, just before community councils were formed. And I thought, I'm going to stand for community council in my village. And I've been a community councillor within my village for 20 odd years since they were um, put together. And when I was about to finish work, I thought, I'm going to try for city council. And I actually got on the city council. And I'm in my second term now. And I think um, women have an awful lot to offer within the council. Yes, we are put down. But you have to be like a dripping tap sometimes and just <laughs> put your opinions, but not be forceful. Because I think then you're going to get um, tremendous barriers against you. And I feel that... You've, you've got to, as I say, be a dripping tap. This is the way I am. I don't go in two feet, but I get officers to do things for me that maybe other people can't do. Well, that's, that's a very interesting point to ask. Thank you very much. Can somebody have their hand up here? What time did you want to finish? Oh, sorry? About 2.30. Oh, I found One more quick point then before... Uh, Carol Lincoln from Energy Saving Trust. I hit the uh, significant age beginning with five a couple of years ago. Um, is that all? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, this is my point. Um, I, I've, had a, I've had a good career, a uh, marketing background, which obviously predominantly encourages a, a younger workforce. And so I'm probably feeling more vulnerable right now uh, in terms of being a woman with my future. So my question to the panel is, especially in the light of pensionable age increasing in the future, where do you see the role of an older, uh, the older woman in the Welsh community in the future? Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask the three panellists to answer, because I'm the chairman and I can do what I like, so I'm going to take an extra time. Um, how, how about you, then? Well, I just think... <laughs> Sorry, I, I know how old you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think that older women have got a lot of experience and that is just invaluable, to be honest. Um, so I see absolutely no issue with that at all. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, like, obviously, older women, you know, obviously you can be inspired by them in business because, you know, they've learned so much from their mistakes as well. And I just think, yeah, it's, you know, it'd be nice to see more younger and more older women in business, especially. Well, I'm nearing the other significant birthday. I'm not very happy about it, I can say. Um, especially as, yeah, they put my pension age off six years. But um, I, I, I feel twofold, yeah. You know, I think I've got a lot of experience. I think I've still got a lot to offer, and I still think I've got a job to do. But I've got two young women uh, who work with me, and they're fantastic. And you know what? I want to feel that I'm right behind them because it's their future, their tomorrow. It's not for me, really, to carry on being that person. It's for me to make sure that they have their opportunities in life now. So it's not that I feel that I haven't got the skills or experience or any of those things. I just want to grow those women and make sure that they have their tomorrow. Wow, what a great way to, to end. 
So can I thank you all terribly um, for, for your contributions. You've been fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I hope that, uh, that it has satisfied uh, presiding officer um, and that there are tasks that have come from um, today's seminar. So diolch mor iawn i'r panel, diolch mor iawn i chi gyd. Well, I think bending edig is my favourite Welsh word at the moment, and I think it's very appropriate today. Um, can I say thank you very much to all of you uh, for, I think, what's been a most interesting discussion. And I think what's interesting, the points you've raised here are the points that have been raised in other places, and we'll probably be raised next week in Newport. So you've challenged me to say, what are we going to do? I don't know, we have to put thinking caps on ready for November, and from that national conference we need, we need a motion which is going to you know, make sure that the people in places of, of influence can actually um, change change things. But I, I've just found this panel, and I would like to thank Alice uh, for finding this fantastic panel. Um, you never really know what you're going to get, because of the people... <laughs> in the nicest possible way. But, but each of the panels we've had have been really interesting, and this one is particularly interesting, because I think there's such a, uh, a diverse uh, approach there. Um, but what's interesting, of course, when you get someone like Rachel, who can show that really the best way for a woman to survive is to set your own business up uh, and to really move forward. And I think uh, no wonder you won prizes. I'm not surprised. But I think the thing that's really put, uh, come clear is what has suddenly triggered you to do what you've done. Uh, it was the fact that you wanted to clean the house um, and you know, make sure somebody wasn't cheating your mother out of some money. And then Paula wanted to do something different. Um, and... I, I, I started off and the same thing, something that pushed me. I was a mother with two small children, so they had to park, no bench. You know, and you stand up for two hours. You, you. <laughs> uh, and and I, I'm of an age where we had park keepers that wouldn't let you sit on a bench if you were 14, or on a swing if you were 14. But I tried to get a bench, but they were all male councillors and they couldn't understand how important this bench was. So an election was coming and I thought I would stand and as well as all the grand things like better education, better housing, I wanted a bench. Now, I wasn't expecting to win because it was a, you know, politically opposite to, to my views, just wanted to embarrass these guys. But actually, my bench resonated with everybody, particularly the women, and I won. Uh, I got my bench within four weeks. And as I think I said on the radio yesterday, that sounds awful, isn't it, as I said on the radio yesterday, <laughs> um, the bench is still there. Unfortunately, all the play equipment is now gone. Um, so I think we have to do... So it's a small thing that suddenly triggers you. Um, and um, I just think it's been... We've heard the word aspiration, but it's inspiration, aspiration today. Those are two fantastic words. And just because somebody's poor doesn't mean they're not bright. And just because somebody's poor means they shouldn't have the opportunity. Uh, and I think it's very important that we try and get... The idea of this is not to get women into politics with big P, it's to get them up into making uh, positions where decisions are made. Because uh, well, I go to lots of conferences, and if it tends to be all men in grey suits, it's a strategy conference. Mm -hmm. And you go to another conference where it's mainly women, it's where we put in those strategies into practice. Mm -hmm. So where the work is going to be done, it tends to be the women. Where the decisions are, it tends to be the men. And that really, I would like to see that changing. So um, I want to see more people on the PTA, more um, school governors, more magistrates, more people on health boards, more people on local government, very important, you know, community councils. And, you know, women are not better than men, they're just very different. And what has come across this afternoon, especially from Rachel, is a consensual way of working. And I think that that is the difference. So um, I talk to lots of primary schools and, I, you know, I say to them, you're going to be the leaders and as the Dalai Lama said, not to me personally, but he said it to somebody, um, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you try sharing a bed with a mosquito. And then you'll know what a small thing can do. So I'm looking to use my mosquitoes. Um, and I'm hoping that um, when we get, you know, from today, that the conference in November will hopefully trigger people. But it's up to every individual one of you to help out somebody else. But again, on the other hand, together we can actually... Uh, say some powerful things. And I think of women, Freedom Common Women, for example, you know, small women kept going, kept going, the, the tap dripping, eventually got rid of nuclear weapons from Freedom Common. So it just shows uh, it can be done. I'm not suggesting we're going to get rid of nuclear weapons. Don't let me go down there today. Um, 
but um, I would like to thank you all very much for coming. I found it fascinating, and I hope that you've made some good contacts today, that you will go out feeling inspired by young people like Rachel, um, not so young people like Paula. Um, <laughs> well, she did admit it, you know, she did admit it. And I would particularly like to thank our chair. You've done a fabulous job. Thank you so much indeed. And uh, have a safe journey home. You're welcome back. Cynulliad Cenedlaethol Cymru yw'r corff sy'n cael ei ethol yn democratydd i gynrychioli buddiannau Cymru a'i phobl, i ddeddfu ar gyfer Cymru ac i ddwyn Llywodraeth Cymru i gyfrif. I gael rhagor o wybodaeth ac i ganfod pwy sydd yn eich cynrychioli, ewch i cynulliadcymru.org neu gallwch chi'n dilyn ar Facebook a Twitter. The National Assembly for Wales is the democratically elected body that represents the interests of Wales and its people, makes laws for Wales and holds the Welsh Government to account. For more information and to find out who represents you, go to assemblywales.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.